May 18th, 1969, 12.49 p.m. With just under seven months before man sets foot on the moon, it is crucial that Apollo 10 succeed. This eight-day flight will feature all three Apollo modules and perform everything but an actual landing on the lunar surface. Much rides on Commander Thomas Stafford from Gemini 6A and 9A, Command Module Pilot John Young, Gemini 3 and 10, and Lunar Module Pilot Eugene Cernan of Gemini 9A. They christen the Command Module Charlie Brown and the Lunar Module Snoopy, after the boy and his dog from cartoonist Charles Schultz's Peanuts comic strip. Charlie Brown and Snoopy will prove pivotal in a moon landing, and like the Peanuts cartoons, Apollo 10 will be broadcast via color television. Three hours into the flight, Apollo 10 transmits color TV images from space. They will broadcast for five hours and 52 minutes at different intervals throughout the entire flight to the throngs of humanity below. The fifth day in, at which point Apollo 10 achieves lunar orbit, Lunar Module Snoopy, bearing Stafford and Cernan, descends towards the moon's surface. It is breathtaking. Less than 47,000 feet above the craggy, barren surface, the two astronauts are the closest man has come to the moon. They survey the Sea of Tranquility, the designated landing zone for Apollo 11. When it is time for the ascent stage to disengage from the descent, something happens. The ascent stage starts to spin out of control. Cernan and Stafford curse while trying to regain control. Stafford had reset the controls in the ship's computer, not realizing that Cernan already had done so. Snoopy's systems became confused and went to the primary guidance system. The pair switch it back to the abort guidance system, and Snoopy is on his way to rendezvous with Charlie Brown. It could have been disastrous. The crew has now tested the systems, and with mission control, it has experienced an entire dress rehearsal. And now, on to Apollo 11 and the moon itself. July 16th, 1969. 9.32 a.m. This is the day that man will reach the moon. If the Apollo 11 crew succeeds, America will win the space race to the lunar surface and make President Kennedy's dream a reality. The astronauts christen Apollo 11 the Columbia. After the Columbiad, the bullet-like spacecraft from Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon. The lunar module in honor of the national bird, is named Eagle. As Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, and Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin sit in the cockpit of Columbia, they hold pieces of history and honor with them. Armstrong carries both a piece of wood and fabric from the Wright Brothers' 1903 airplane and a diamond-studded astronaut badge given to Deke Slayton by the Apollo 1 widows. Both the world's first pilots and Apollo's fallen astronauts have a presence on this historical voyage. The world watches from the edges of their seats as, at the Kennedy Space Center, the Saturn V rocket bearing Apollo 11 ignites and lifts off. The Earth itself shakes as the power of the Saturn V propels the three men into the heavens. Two and a half hours later, after leaving Earth, the escape velocity begins. Apollo 11 heads for the moon. 100 hours later, from lunar orbit, the Eagle undocks from the Columbia. Armstrong and Aldrin prepare for their descent. Roger, Eagle's undocked. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. Roger. Present in mission control and witness to this is a who's who of space dignitaries. This is Apollo Control at 101 hours, 54 minutes. 
Uh, we're now about uh, 20 minutes, 45 seconds from reacquiring the uh, command module on the uh, 14th revolution. The uh, time until the ignition for the powered descent is 38 minutes, 55 seconds. Here in mission control, people still standing uh, and waiting. I believe back in the viewing room, we probably have one of the largest assemblages of space officials that we've ever seen in one place. The mood is tense as Columbia and Eagle momentarily travel beyond radio range. It's grown quite quiet here in mission control. A few moments ago, flight director Gene Kranz uh, requested that uh, Everyone sit down, uh, get prepared for events that are coming, and he closed with the remark, good luck to all of you. Uh, here in the, uh, on the front of our display boards, uh, we have uh, a number of big plot boards which will be used to keep track of the uh, burn progress. Among the more important of those is one which will show the performance of the onboard guidance systems, both the primary and the backup guidance system, and compare the guidance systems with the manned spaceflight network tracking. Uh, these displays, by the time this is all over, will look a good deal like a combination Christmas tree, 4th of July. With communication re-established, an eagle hovering over the moon's rocky surface, Armstrong and Aldrin are given the go to descend. But then there is a problem. At the Earth, right out our front window. Houston, you're looking at our Delta Eagle. Oh, it looks good, uh, Fly. It looks good. Looks good. Looks are you good accepting it, guidance? It's 1202. 1202. The lunar module computer is overwhelmed by the influx of data, causing the 1202 error. Mission Control's computer experts determine a go is still in order. Another 1202 warning goes off, but Aldrin and Armstrong maintain their descent. Soon, they are a go for landing. As Neil Armstrong pilots Eagle in for a landing, both men notice what may be a fatal misstep. They overshoot their intended landing spot in the Sea of Tranquility and are now headed towards a very large crater. With their fuel running low, it will take Armstrong's prowess to safely land. Armstrong is forced to take a gamble. He burns up some depleting fuel reserves in the right bank of boosters, clearing the rocky surface below, and finds a safer, more level area to land. The fuel is diminishing as the astronauts head to the moon's surface slowly. Will it hold out? Aldrin and Armstrong prepare Eagle for an emergency liftoff as a contingency, and they eat a meal. They're supposed to take a sleep period, but they opt to delay that. They have a moon to discover. Sleep can wait. History cannot. Neil Armstrong lowers the ladder to the moon's surface. Television cameras broadcast his walk to the entire world at home. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. These words are more than just an answer to President John F. Kennedy's challenge to reach the moon. They are words that will be forever emblazoned as a marker of mankind's achievement, proving our ability to overcome seeming impossibilities to make dreams come true. Even when challenged against the backdrop of strife, war, and tension. But for now, Aldrin and Armstrong have experiments to conduct and observations to make. Samples are collected, photographs are taken, and the lunar surface is tested. After two and a quarter hours, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong re-enter the lunar module Eagle
for some much-needed sleep. They do make time for a phone call at 11.49 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. President Richard Nixon calls them from the Oval Office. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made from the White House. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you have done. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. And for people all over the world, I am sure that they too join with Americans in recognizing what an immense feat this is. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. And as you talk to us from the sea of tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this Earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done and one in our prayers that you will return safely to Earth. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here representing not only the United States, but and of peace of all nations and with interest and a curiosity and and with the vision for the future. Uh, honor for us to be able to participate here today. And thank you very much, and I look forward, all of us look forward to seeing you on the Hornet on Thursday. Look forward to that very much, sir. President Nixon's call must have been a great relief for the Commander-in-Chief. In the event that Aldrin and Armstrong were stranded on the moon, the country's leader had to be prepared to speak words of comfort to the American people. 21 hours after their landing on the moon, Eagle ascends to meet up with Collins in the command module. With all three astronauts reunited within the Columbia, they speed down into the atmosphere at a speed of 36,194 feet per second and splash down in the Pacific Ocean. Collins, Armstrong and Aldrin arrive on a very different Earth from the one they'd left eight days earlier. This new Earth has witnessed man walking on the moon. The possibilities are now limitless.